Welcome to Digital Marketing Intelligence for Shopify Ask the Experts, our bi-weekly live show and podcast that features expert interviews and case studies to show you what to do and what's new in Shopify and e-commerce digital marketing for 2022 and beyond. Ask questions, suggest topics, and grow faster with actionable insights and proven strategies from the world's leading Shopify and e-commerce marketing experts. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Digital Marketing Intelligence for Shopify Ask the Experts. I'm Marissa Morgan, your show host. I'm also the Director of Business Development here at Engage. On behalf of myself and the whole team at Engage, I want to welcome you to today's show. Today, we're doing a case study, and it is a case study based on a jewelry brand. We're going to be introducing you to the owner and founder of Luca and Danny. It is an artisan jewelry brand, and we're very excited to hear a little bit more about the story behind the brand. But more importantly, I know you're here to learn about Shopify, how to grow your business, how to manage more SKUs, how to increase your traffic, and the Luca and Danny founder and owner himself will be here to share how he has discovered the success in some of those different areas and and some of the pain points that he has overcome. Before I introduce you to our special guest in just a moment, I want to be sure that you stick around because after today's talk and our special guest, I will, of course, be sharing our Engage News of the Week. Our Engage Digital Marketing News of the Week will have to do with something in the world of e-commerce. So if you are looking to get into e-commerce, if you have a product or you're currently, you know, hosting a Shopify store, stay tuned because our Engage News of the Week always offers some great insight into that world. Now, before we get started, of course, I want to announce that at Engage, we're so excited because in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be rolling out our brand new SMS messaging for Shopify app. If you didn't know it, right now, SMS messaging has about a 98% open rate versus emails, which only have about a 20% open rate. So if you're not currently taking advantage of SMS marketing for your small to mid-sized business, you're not only missing out on opportunities like building your customer list, automated messaging, uh, promoting new products and incentives, rewards, you're not only missing out on that, but you're also missing out on the opportunity to drive more traffic, of course, to your Shopify store. And that's what our app is aimed to do. So it's going to be launching in just uh, really a matter of days. So stay tuned for more information on that. And in the meantime, I would love for you to visit our LinkedIn page. That way you can stay in the know and you can be made aware right when our app launches and it's available. And also, With our app launching, we're offering a free 30-day trial, and with that trial, you get 500 SMS messages to use completely free during your trial so that you can give our app a test drive and find out how perfectly it works for your small to mid-sized business. So check out LinkedIn. Look for the Engage company page. If you're listening on the podcast, that's N-G-A-G-G-E. And our logo is a rainbow colored cog wheel. So look for that and then you'll know you're in the right place. And that's where you can find updates on the launch of our new app, SMS Messaging for Shopify by Engage. All right, everybody, I'm super excited to welcome you. Someone from my neck of the woods, the East Coast. His name is Fred. Fred? Oh, gosh, I just practiced Fred and I'm going to mess it up. (laughs) That's okay. Your last name's a lot like mine. It sounds Italian. Uh, Fred Magnamini. Good. I like it. Yeah. Not bad. Okay. It's good. It's good. It's joining good. us. Uh, well, he, I think he's joining us from, from Rhode Island, but he spent a lot of time in New York. His son's name is Brooklyn. I see the Brooklyn Bridge behind you. Do you go back and forth, Fred, from New York and Rhode Island, or are you staying in one place more nowadays? Um, you know, I'm. We've, we're like 75 people now, and I'm I'm in the grind, so I don't get to get out as much as I I, I want to. I think you know, COVID certainly made travel to the city uh, tough the last couple of years, but um, committed this spring and into the summer to spend uh, spend more time down. There's, the, there's nothing like going into the city, like the vibe and the energy around being in New York. So I think it's uh, it's therapeutic and I still have a lot of friends there. So yeah, I'm in Brooklyn. Brooklyn's my five-year-old. Um, Luca's my oldest. He just turned 12 today. And Stella, whose middle name is actually Danny, um, is my nine-year-old daughter. So kind of cool. I named the, the company 
um, after my kids, the Brooklyn was sort of a, a last minute addition. He came after the company was founded, but uh, nice to be able to kind of weave my family into, into what I do day to day, which is pretty cool. Well, I love that you shared that little tidbit with us because I'm going to jump into a quick bio about you so our audience knows more about you and your story. And your story really is, I mean, made my heart just flutter. Your story really is based a lot in family. And uh, the arrival of Luca and Danny really did start with a beautiful family memory. So for our audience joining us, I just want to remind you, our show is live. I'm joining you live right now from Minnesota. We've got uh, Fred joining you from Rhode Island. And if you're joining us live right now on LinkedIn, on Facebook, feel free to drop a note in the comment section and let us know where you're joining us from. And of course, if you have any questions for Fred during our show today or comments, feel free to drop those as well. I'm introducing you guys to Fred. And prior to founding Luca and Danny, Fred spent an impressive 12 years working in the hedge fund and equity derivatives business. That stuff very much confuses me, but I love the movie Wolf of Wall Street. So <laughs> just going to say, I don't know if it's really like that in your world or what if it was like that in your world. But um, then Fred shared with me that after you know 12 years in that business, life kind of just happened. And by that, he meant that in April of 2013, he sadly lost his younger brother, who was only 33, to cancer. And like many cancer patients, Danny wanted a second chance to live and enjoy the simple pleasures of life that I know we all take for granted. And I really love this. Fred was so moved by the loss of his brother and his desire to, you know, really live life, right? Joie de vie, that he decided to take his family's third generation jewelry manufacturing business, which was started in 1955 and located, you know, uh, overseas and relocate this to Rhode Island and launch this brand, Luca and Danny, in his brother's name. Uh, he, Fred says that his brother's you know, journey and some of the things that he went through in life really taught him to embrace the journey of life. And through the platform of Luca and Danny, then Fred and his company, which I love to hear now that it's growing to over 70 people, they really seek to empower others to remember the joy in life. And they really love to tell a story um, through their brand. So Fred, such a wonderful bio on you. So many wonderful, just a feel good story. And I love how that, you you know, you took a, a tragedy and sadness and really turned around and uh, made it something special and something that is obviously growing and, and really touching a lot of people across the globe. So tell us a, a little more about your jewelry brand. I know it's an artisan jewelry brand. What yeah. else would you like to share with the audience about what your brand is? What makes it different from other jewelry brands out there? Yeah, I think it starts, I mean, you, you summed up my story perfectly. Um, you know, some people start a brand because they want to solve a problem or they have an idea. Um, I went through kind of a life event, right? And, um, you know, my family started a jewelry manufacturing business. My grandfather started a jewelry manufacturing business in Rhode Island in 1955. This area was once the epicenter of costume jewelry manufacturing um, in the world. 80% of the costume jewelry was produced here and then it went all overseas. And so I, so I grew up with with jewelry people, right? It's something I spent my my summers, like every summer, my dad would teach me and my brother like one aspect of how to make jewelry. At the time we hated it, we thought it was a complete waste of time. But he very much wanted ingrained, <laughs> you know, learning learning a learning a craft. And you know what I realized when my brother was sick is that this business had been decimated by globalization and all the stuff that had gone overseas. And he was really like he wasn't married and have kids. He was really passionate about trying to find a way to uh, to really reinvent the business and to do something special with it. We had all this infrastructure. We had great employees. You know, my family knows how to how to craft jewelry, which is a, a little bit of a lost art form. Um, and I felt I felt moved by it. Um, you know, I was a father of two at the time. I had like a my my daughter was like four or five months old at the time. And I saw how much of a struggle my dad went through. And I was like, you want to what? Like, I could leave my career on Wall Street. Let me come and sort of take a chance at doing this. And in the beginning, believe it or not, it was really just about me and him, like, like trying to, like, heal together, you know, and, like, bring the family closer together. And I just felt like my dad just wasn't in a, a place where he could do this alone. So it, it started, it started, um, it started from, like, a really, really good place. 
Um, and then you need a good product, right? And so I gave myself a year and 11 and a half months into that year journey. And that year was hard. I, I really struggled with leaving a career that I had worked hard, hard on. Um, we found this wire wrapped way of making a bracelet. So it sort of violated all the ways that you would make a bracelet. I was moved by witnessing women buying jewelry as a form of self-expression, right? Um, a lot of the meaning-based pieces they're buying because they have some sort of connection. And I'm like, instead of a charm hanging down or going around a wrist, why not have it sit on the top of your wrist, right? That thing that you're really passionate about and you have some sort of connection with, why not go and show that to the world? And so we sort of reverse engineered a, a concept. I was lucky because uh, we had a factory and I had a lot of people around me who knew how to how to make things and and uh, and they taught me. Um, I avoided a lot of mistakes because I had that that support network. Um, and then we leveraged Shopify to to create a brand and and to go out and start to talk about our message and our product. Um, and we were lucky because it was uh, you know late 2015. It was a little bit easier to run Facebook ads, but we found, started to build a community. Um, and from there, we've sort of progressively taken the steps that I think a lot of brands uh, do in terms of building their business. But I'm excited today because I've made every mistake in the book. I knew nothing <laughs> about, I knew nothing about e-commerce. Um, yeah, I worked on a trading desk. So you, you, when I didn't, wasn't on social media. I'd have a Facebook account. Um, I didn't know how to look at a P&L. So I've asked me any question you want. I've made every single possible mistake that you could make. And I think that's part of the, you know, it's part of the entrepreneurial journey. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of you out there who are looking to start businesses probably don't have the experience, but you got the passion and you, you, you've, you've got the ability to figure it out as, as, as you go. And that's really, I, I think I've found that that's the, the biggest driving force um, with entrepreneurs who are able to kind of get that idea over the hurdle and actually go and, and, and start a brand. Well, I'm very excited because a lot of people are starting to join us right now on LinkedIn Live and Facebook. If you guys have any questions at all for Fred, make sure you drop those in the comment section. We love this interactive live platform because it really is a, a chance to, you know, have a conversation, you, you and I, Fred, but it's also a chance for the audience to be engaged as well. Let's start off with a really, you know, top line question that I actually was curious about. When you first decided to get into the e-commerce world, did you try other platforms before trying Shopify? Or did someone lead you to Shopify and say, hey, this platform is so great. Is that where you started? So how did you find Shopify? Yeah, so our, our business, um, and this is pretty cool. So I, I sort of come from the lineage of learning under my dad. And my dad was an OEM manufacturer. So he... He sold to brands who then sold to retailers who then sold to consumers. Oh, wow. Um, and, yeah. And so obviously you've got a lot of margin compression there. Like you can really only make money if you're doing like, like very large jobs right. uh, or, or very large production runs. And so our, our first iteration of Luke and Danny was really selling directly to retailers, um, specialty ind independent shops that would have like a Pandora, a Kendra Scott, a Vera Bradley. Um, and we thought, that was amazing, right? Because it's like, instead of selling to the distributor, I'm selling right to, 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 to the retailer. You're cutting out um, the middlemen in essence for you, really. Yeah. And, and so it, it what happened with, with our brand is, is pretty cool. My, uh, I won't name names on the, on the podcast for, for sake of being polite, but, um, I actually got cut out, cut out of that channel by my largest competitor. And at the time we were a small company, maybe eight or nine months old. We had four employees. We optically looked a lot bigger than we actually were, were at the time. We were still, in hindsight, trying to figure a lot of stuff out. Um, and this this brand sent a letter to all of their stores and basically said, if you sell to us, you can't sell to, 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 to Luke and Danny. So it forced me to have to figure out, and we were 95% B2B. Um, we had a small Shopify site. I had found Shopify by, by Googling. Um, and it forced us to really sort of have to make that pivot that we probably wouldn't have made quite as fast because we were kind of comfortable um, with uh, with the B2B business. And then I think once we really sort of like focused on it and understood all the aspects of Shopify, and at the time they kind of had like Wix, you could, Magento was too expensive. Um, it was a little bit of big, big e-commerce, but Shopify was really the one that kept coming up. And what was 
what was great, I remember we did our first uh, template. I, I actually built it, knew nothing about coding or how to set up a website. Um, we used the template out of Pixel Union, um, spent $120, which I thought at the time was a lot for a website template. And we ran, I don't know, nine or $10 million through that website before we ended up doing a, a full blown um, web redesign. And so what I loved about Shopify was the ability to just sort of plug and play uh, the interface was really easy. Um, you didn't really need a development team and you know, we have that now it makes it a lot easier, but, um, you know, the barrier to entry to starting something and being able to do all aspects from selling to inventory to shipping, you've got this amazing ecosystem. Even then it was young, but you still had all these things that you could plug in. Um, and it made things a lot easier and it started to get fun. Like we started to just get excited about the ability to really reach our consumers, build a community. Um, be able to test products and like get that first party data where we could understand what was going on. Um, so we stumbled on Shopify, but I think very quickly for us, we realized that this was the the best platform. My only regret is I did not buy Shopify stock. Then. Ah, how many of us are kicking <laughs> ourselves for not buying like Amazon or Shopify or especially Peloton stock or Pel Peloton right before COVID, right? Well, I think that's a really cool story because what I'm gathering from you is, is you are very hands-on. Um, obviously, even just the name of the brand uh, has a lot of meaning to you. Uh, and it's very much about your family. Uh, and it sounds like when you were like, okay, I want to do this. How do I do this? The first thing you did was go to Google and say, hey, what's a good platform to do this? And that's essentially how you landed on Shopify. And like many of our case study participants, uh, even in other categories, the one common thing I hear, um, a common thread through all of your stories is that you love Shopify because it's so easy to integrate, you know, other, other apps and other, um, you know, it's just very easy to integrate and it's very easy to do everything you need right on the platform and have access to, like you said, metrics and inventory. And I think for any small to mid-sized business, that's right there, one of the biggest benefits to Shopify. Would you agree? Yeah, um, we're, we, we've moved to Plus a couple of years ago. Um, and there's the added benefit of like having some of the customer support. The other thing I really like about Shopify, I'm a founder, I'm an entrepreneur. I like being in the weeds on things. Um, I like to test, you know, like I, I, I don't, you know, if I want to do something, I don't overthink it. I, I try it. You know, a lot of things I think you can have analysis paralysis and like overthink a decision where if I want to turn this, you know, $9.99 a month app on with no commitment, if I don't like it, I'll turn it off the next month. Right. So right. what I love about the ecosystem is you have a lot of small entrepreneurs that are building apps in Shopify that if you reach out to them, they're more than willing to help you. Right. Mm -hmm. Where I, I, I do that with, um, you know, we use NetSuite as an ERP system and to try to get customer support from them is non-existent or it's going to cost you a fortune. And it's nice mm -hmm. because on Shopify, it's like you can have a direct personal relationship with um, a lot of the app developers. If you need something fixed or done, a lot of times those guys are looking to grow their business. And so they're willing to do it. The other thing that helped us early on was just like reading about what other brands are doing. Like what, mm -hmm. you know, if I want to, if I want to put Instagram on my, on my homepage, right. You know, pure Vita is using 460, right. So let me go investigate that app. Um, and so there was a lot of research where we could actually go between product reviews or app reviews uh, on the app store and then talk, like case studies with other brands. And then the other thing we found out is like, I just start on LinkedIn, just start reaching out to other brand owners and say like, Hey, I've got this problem. Uh, did you find a solution in Shopify? And, um, a lot of brand owners, myself included, like if you reach out with a problem and I've made that mistake and I can recommend a really good app. I'm going to advocate for it because it's just kind of how this group works and rolls. Um, and so for anyone who's looking to start a business or anyone who's looking, who's on Shopify and looking to get on, on the Shopify, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to other brand owners. And LinkedIn is a great tool. Um, all of us, like I've learned a lot of stuff by having mentors who taught me. Uh, the first step was actually having the guts to kind of reach out and ask for help. Mm -hmm. What I found is that most people, if you ask them for help and you do it the right way, they're more than willing to give you uh, their time. So I think there's just around Shopify in general, I just think there's a really awesome ecosystem of entrepreneurs, founders, and brands that are love the platform and, and want to do whatever they can in order to make it successful, which is pretty cool. 
I agree. And I think that word ecosystem is so great because everybody wants to support each other. And you mentioning how you've actually reached out to app developers for help with things ties right into what we're doing at Engage with our app coming out very, very soon, SMS messaging for Shopify. We have a 24-7 support line, you know, so when people are getting excited about jumping on and, and using an app like ours, which will help with their Shopify SMS messaging, it's so great to know that app developers like us are available to help because I know that uh, there's another common thread that we've seen kind of woven um, through many of our guests. And that is, again, I mentioned that you sound like you're a hands-on kind of guy, but as your business is, has grown, and obviously now you said you've got 70 plus employees, which is awesome. Business owners and founders are learning to more freely and openly delegate, right? Focus on what you do best and start using other applications, maybe hire an agency for a certain task. Um, and that really allows, I think, founders and CEOs of businesses like yours to, again, focus on what you do best and not get lost trying to do everything because the reality is not, you know, not a lot of small businesses can afford a tech staff at the very beginning, right? Um, yeah. But a lot of app developers are willing to help. And there are agencies out there that are, you know, many have specific niches, like maybe email marketing or social media marketing, and they can help you fill in the gaps um, where maybe you don't feel so confident, right? Yeah. No, I think it's a good point. I think uh, like when I, you know, one of my New Year's resolutions this year was to, 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 to push more onto my team. Mm -hmm. Um you know, transparently, like I'm a great founder. I'm a great entrepreneur. I get very curious about how to fix things. And um, if I really am excited about something, I'm pretty unrelenting in terms of trying to find a solution for it. I haven't been as good at delegating, you know, so things um, sometimes it's easier just if I do it versus having someone else do it. And I think for me, and I'll, I'll say this very openly, my career progression from a founder to a CEO has has really involved building a team and then taking a little bit of a step back and kind of letting them make their own decisions so um i may not like the home page today i have got to parse i got to you know sort of pick my battles in terms of like whether or not uh just because i think it doesn't mean it's right i'm wrong with a lot of things and i think uh i i've, I've learned that uh, letting go of certain things if you hire the right people and you give them the opportunity to be able to own things, um, you, you got to kind of let them go and, and, and make, make decisions. And I think for me, that's been, and I've really worked hard on it, uh, say the last eight or nine months, it's something that doesn't come intuitive to me. Um, and I've gotten to a place where I'm actually really, really comfortable with it. So things like org structure, year end reviews, um, you know, hey, if I could send something in an email that maybe misconstrued versus actually picking up the phone and calling someone or maybe mm. waiting a day. Mm -hmm. So I'm not emotional about something, all of those things. I think as you, as you go from employee one to now I'm at 72 employees, I think those are the things that, you know, really, really are, are important. I think anyone who's in this space right now is realizing that ad costs are getting more expensive. It's never been easier to, 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 to launch a brand. Um, everyone's vying for the same eyeballs in terms of consumers. And I think a lot of what makes or breaks you is really having this, this team around you that allows you to do things that you're not good at. And part of that's with founders or people who are in C-level positions to be able to say, here's what I'm good at and I'm going to do. And then here's the stuff that I'm not good at that I'm actually going to push over to, to people, whether they be internal hires or agencies. Um, and that's been a, a tough lesson for me without going into too much history. So if I could relay that to anyone who's who's starting a business um you know i think the sooner you do that the, the easier it'll be for you well congrats on now 72 people in your company that's really really impressive um let's let's talk about a couple pain points that i think are very common uh for many small to mid-sized businesses out there especially um, businesses that have a product, whether it's jewelry or maybe like a gourmet coffee or maybe a, I'm trying to think like a, some sort of widget or gadget. Um, as you mentioned earlier, you're, you came into the business because of your passion, because of your family history. You didn't really set out to say, hey, I'm going to solve this pain point, right? 
And one of the things we talk about on our series consistently is a big part of driving traffic to your store is making it clear that you're going to help solve a prospect customer's pain point. How, as a jewelry brand, do you feel like you've had to kind of shift that a little bit? How are you driving traffic to your store, given that your product is very like beauty, you know, it's very personal, it's memories. How did you yeah. manage to kind of shift to be able to drive the traffic? So I think we're running like the playbook of what you need to do in order to drive traffic. Um, it, it's it's kind of out there, right? So it's 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 paid. So Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Pinterest. Um, you got to build an email file. Like we're we're probably close to five hundred thousand people on the email file, which makes it a lot easier. But early days with email, you're sending it out. You don't have a lot of people that are on the file. SMS has been a great channel. So glad to see you guys are, are launching uh, a solution there. Uh, open rates are great. And it's another way to kind of engage customers. I'm on my phone all day long. Uh, may not check an email, but I'll always look at look at a text. Um, and then I think, you know, you know, if you can, like we're looking at Omnichannel, right? So we sell on Nordstrom, we're onboarding on Macy's. I was on Home Shopping Network. Um, just any platform where you can go out and get your story out there and talk about your products. Um, PR is a good, a good, a good area. Influencer marketing. So it's not unknown of like what you actually what you need to do. Um, mm -hmm. I've always taken the viewpoint that you know our business is about creating some sort of emotional connection. I don't view us as being in the jewelry business. It's the widget that we sell. For us, it's really about we're storytellers in one aspect, right? So we need to be good at marketing. We need to be able to connect our consumer with the products that we're, we're, we're talking about. Part of that's the actual physical product, but then part of it's also, um, it's marketing, it's creative, it's storytelling. It's, it's, you know, moving our consumers to be able to want to open up his or her wallet. For us, it's, it's mainly hers in order to be able to, to want to either purchase our product and more importantly, be, be part of our community, right? Um, a lot of what, what we do is really focused on uh, co-creating. So if I take that sunflower as an example, um, sunflowers right now are, are, are really hot because they're the national flower of Ukraine and we did a give back to support a Ukraine charity. So people are saying it's a sunflower, but my emotional connection is with you know, sort of what's going, the suffering of the Ukrainian people, push aside any of the political views, like what's going on with them is very unfair. It's tragic. It's impacting kids. It's breaking apart families. I want to be able to do something for us that it's not about the jewelry. It's about creating that connection. And so we look to different channels to be able to, to do that. Um, direct mail is, a, is another one that we're, we're sort of really doubling down on and having a lot of success. I think importantly for any founders out there, every channel, like I have three kids, I love all of them the same, but they're all different. Right? <laughs> so if I, if I parent my, my youngest who's downstairs, I parent him very differently than my, my oldest because their personalities are very different. They respond differently to different things. And so when we look at, we look at channels, um, you know, Facebook as an example, very visual channel. You could test a lot of different ideas. Generally in 36 hours, you can know whether or not something's gonna work. It's a direct plug into the consumer. Yes, it's more expensive. Yes, it's kind of a pain relative to a couple of years ago, but it's still a great channel. Um, mm -hmm. We treat that channel very different than we would treat direct mail or TikTok. And so I think understanding um, what works in these respective channels, a lot of it's testing. Um, I think what we've done and what I've done really well is uh, we're really bad at forecasting. So, and I make a, an analogy to baseball, right? So if I, if I hit the ball three out of 10 times, I'm probably going to the hall of fame, but it means that I've been wrong 70% of the time, or, or I haven't achieved my goal 70% of the time. If I go back and I run a forecast and I think I'm pretty good at it. And at the end of the season, I look at my statistical variance, I'm completely wrong. So we've shifted from what we think, and that's definitely an input, to actually what the consumer wants. So the consumer, and this is a cool aspect about our business, the consumer tells us what we do. And I'm in a lucky position because we have a, an actual manufacturing facility. We'll just adjust our production almost in real time to 
what our consumers want. So if you look at my demand plan, um, you know, in March, I think we would have forecasted 100 or 200 sunflowers. I'll probably sell 5,000. We'll leverage all of our production our production abilities because the consumer's resonating with that and things that we didn't think were going to work. So I think when you're thinking about marketing, I think you got to build out your marketing funnel. You got to be committed to it. You got to understand what works. It will take time. Um, you're going to spend money to learn what not to do. Um, we've all done that. My first iterations of Facebook, you know, we spent money to learn what what doesn't work. Um, and then I think you got to understand your consumer and and how he or she changes and what she's looking for, for from you. And I think a lot of times, and this has been a bit of a struggle in the early days for me, you kind of look at what other brands are doing, you try to replicate that. Inevitably, whenever we did that, it didn't work. And then whenever we kind of just did our own stuff of like, hey, no one's done this or it doesn't make sense or it's not the, the standard playbook, that's actually the stuff that works for us. So we've yeah. become very comfortable being in our own skin and, and kind of approaching things in an authentic way. I know a lot there to unpack, but um, you know, I uh, I've lived, I've got the scars to sort of no. pr prove the battles of having to build out that stuff. Well, I think that the timing of your show is is really impeccable because just earlier this week we had Lydia Martinez. She's the founder and CEO of L L Marketing and Events, and one of the things that she said was so important when it comes to your e-commerce presence, your Shopify store, is making sure that when a customer visits your store, they're not just bombarded and immediately with a catalog of these are my products, right? A, B, and C, yep. and D. And I have to give you credit because, you know, if, if you're watching live on the show right now, I've got Luca and Danny, what, the Luca and Danny website up for, you know, for you to view. If you're on the podcast, I'll kind of describe what I see. But the minute I come to your page, I immediately feel a sense of calmness. And I think that's because of the colors you have going on, pastels and the calming colors of like the seafoam green and the blue. And yes, you have a nice list at the very top of the products that you offer. However, before I really notice that, I do see this, the power of peace, the sunflower bracelet you were just describing. And I love that right away, I see a little bit about your brand and your story because I'm seeing that it's a give back opportunity. It says 50% of all sales from the yellow sunflower bangle bracelet will be donated to Sunflower of Peace to support Ukraine. And this ties beautifully into what Lydia was saying needs to happen. It's so important for especially a small brand or an up and coming like a family business like yours to make sure that the customer or the prospect customer understands your story, understands the meaning behind your brand. You're not just this mass produced, maybe out of a foreign country. There is a lot that goes into not only the manufacturing, but the thought behind your designs. And the fact that you do offer a give back to charity situation is something that you should be so proud of. And it's something you want the customer to know right away. This is who we are. This is part of our brand. We like to give back. This is a family business. You've all done it so beautifully. And I really love your hashtag. I believe it's Embrace the Journey. It was up at the top is kind of your tagline, but you turn that right into a hashtag. There it is, Embrace the Journey, which I think yeah. so beautifully sums up how you feel about what's gone on in your life and your family. Yeah, and I think for anyone who's an entrepreneur or founder um, building something on Shopify, I mean, you're going through the same stuff I went through. Like, you know, the whole journey of, of starting an idea and then getting it to scale and, you know, kind of all the things that you learn uh, along the way. I mean, I look at just career development wise for me, I look at how different I am a year ago. And a lot of it's just sort of trial and error and kind of learning and surrounding myself with with better people and and really sort of elevating uh, approach to building a business. So, yeah, I think it I, I, I we, we love that. It's part of our DNA. I think the other thing that's important is um, for anyone who's out there who's a founder, like you, it, to, to have a business be successful, you've got to be good at marketing and storytelling. Like it's mm -hmm. not something that you can outsource. Um, we found and we even with a small scrappy team, we found that we could never take our, our voice like we can have people do bits and pieces of what we do, but if we don't understand our story and we can't tell our story and get people excited about it, that's not something that you can outsource. You can outsource aspects of it and you could certainly get expertise with it. But I think to, to, to be in the selling of physical products space, especially like CPG, consumer goods, 
I think you've, you've got to understand marketing. And I think for me, a lot of marketing isn't selling a product. It's about, it's about telling a story. It's one of the things that my dad kind of always, always told us um, growing up. And then I've been lucky. We, we have investors in my business. We raised the uh, venture capital money. Um, and it forced me to have to like sort of truncate down my story and get people who are not necessarily familiar with jewelry, we're pitching mainly to men, get them excited about the business, the vision, sort of like what, what we want to build. And I think for any entrepreneurs out there, I think if you don't have that right and you're not crystal clear about it, it can evolve. It can change over time. My, my vision changes, but if you don't feel like that's right. Everything else that you build on top of that foundation isn't going to be solid. And so I think for everyone, I think it's really about figuring out how you could tell a story, how you can build a community. That's what great brands are. Like they're not buying Luke and Danny because it's a piece of jewelry. They're buying it because it's part of a, a broader community. Any of the brands that I buy, I buy them not because of the product. The product has to be good, but I buy it because of what they stand for. It could be my consumer experience. It could be like the values of the brand. It could just be like I love Buck Mason. I'm wearing a, I'm a Tar Heel. So March Madness. I'm wearing my Carolina hoodie. But I love Buck Mason hoodies. And you want to know why I love them? Because they're great products. And I remember telling my head of e-commerce at the time on uh, Black Friday, I said I love Buck Mason's promo. And so he goes on his computer and he pulls it up and he goes, "There's no promo." And I said, "I love that about that. They are not going to run a promotion. That's part of who they are." I, as a consumer, know I'm not going to wait for a deal. It's great product at a fair price. I'm just going to buy it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think if you're building a brand, I think you've got to really focus on building a community and be able to tell that uh, tell that story through tell all story. aspects of your marketing funnel. Absolutely. And it's so clear to me when I go to your website, as I mentioned. And for those of you who are listening on the podcast, in just a few minutes, I'll share his uh, website, but it's, it's very easy. It's lucadanny.com, L-U-C-A-D-A-N-N-I.com. Check it out. The story, the feeling, the emotions, uh, especially your, your photographs are absolutely stunning. You've done such a nice job telling the story through your vis visual representations. Um, it's just so, it, there's just a feeling that gets evoked from your website. So kudos. You're definitely practicing what you preach, Fred. Um, I want to ask you one last question or discuss one last pain point before we wrap up our talk today. And that is, it's also apparent when I visit your website that you have a ton of SKUs, so many products, bracelets. Here, I'll actually pop up the, uh, I absolutely love your website. It's just so beautiful. I could look at it all day long. You've got bracelets, but let's go up to the top because we've got your kind of catalog. You've got bracelets, you've got personalization, you have gifts. Let's click on all jewelry. You've got bracelets, stack sets, necklace, earrings, anklets, anklets, ornaments. And then of course you even have gift cards. Um, yeah. How have you been able to manage all your SKUs, especially as you're growing? I know your team's getting bigger. Shopify gives you a lot of tools to use. What's been the biggest help? in managing your SKUs? Um, you know, I think, so we have about 3,000 SKUs right now. So every bracelet wow. style, like that sunflower comes in uh, two finishes and three sizes. Um, we felt like sizing was important if it's gonna sit on the top of the wrist. Um, people have different wrist sizes. And so for us, that was a very conscious decision that we thought the engineering of the product uh, necessitated carrying a little bit more inventory. Um, you know, it's a challenge. I'd say if you looked at my balance sheet right now, we're probably carrying more inventory than my finance team would, would like. Um, <laughs> so I think it's a struggle. Um, we we're trying to figure out like, what is that? What is that optimal blend in terms of like, what's mm -hmm. the right amount of SKUs and then what's the right amount of inventory to back up the SKUs? Um, you know, we're, we're lucky because we're vertically integrated. So I don't necessarily need to forecast things out. You know, we're not buying products from China. So I think a lot of the things that we've been able to do, um, we're lucky because we have just in time production. Um, mm -hmm. It's one of the things that I would, I would implore people who are starting a business, you know, if you have the ability to have things made locally, even if it costs you a little bit more, um, your margin isn't quite as high, but you have the flexibility to sort of like react pretty quickly mm -hmm. in this environment. Um, you know, March is incredibly challenging and everything that we thought was going to happen in March hasn't happened. There's all these geopolitical risks, the consumer's getting squeezed, the ability to like 
adjust your inventory by having really, really good vendors and having um, the ability to like wait until the last minute to be able to go and produce things. I think for us has been um, has been a little bit of a of a blessing. Um, the last point is I think there's what we've learned is more is not necessarily better. Mm -hmm. So um, you know I'm learning as I go. If it's a bad product, you you just got to find a get way to get rid of it, right? So again, mm -hmm. um, I work with our product development team. We have a lot of ideas. In hindsight, not all of those ideas were were good ideas. And so I think making sure that you have a healthy, you know, you have enough of a scope. Um, so it looks like you have enough selection. If you're going into new categories, try not to do it with one or two items, build out a, a deep enough collection. Um, but don't get in, you know, that inventory is the number one thing that can kill a great business and a great product. Don't, yeah, so, it sounds like don't don't bring in or design inventory to have inventory for the sake. It sounds yeah, like everything that you make still has a purpose and meaning. It's very well thought out. Yeah, and it's okay. I think the thing that I struggle with is it's okay to go sold out, right? Like if you if you yeah. take a position and it sells out and you're not stuck with any inventory and you can restock it, then that's not necessarily a um, a, a bad thing. So all all things I've learned the hard way, unfortunately. Well, you're doing a fantastic job. Like I said, practicing what you preach. Your website is beautiful. I noticed I got an offer right when I visited the website. Put in my email for fifteen percent off. Uh, your website's very easy to navigate. The photography is beautiful. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of flow through your website. I noticed as I clicked on other pages to shop other categories, there was still a nice reminder at the top about the sunflower promotion. So really nice flow. Everything's really tied together. I might just have to do some shopping after today's show, Fred. We'll <laughs> pick some stuff out. We'll uh, we'll, we'll gift you. And then uh, for any of your guests, honestly, if you guys have any questions, uh, I'm Fred at LucaDanny.com. Um, reach out, email me. I've probably gone through whatever you're going through. Um, or hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, so I'm going to put your email real fast in here for everybody. Yep. LucaDanny.com. And then I will definitely, let's put your email up first. Yeah, let's share how everybody yeah. can connect with you. Make sure that's spelled right, right? Okay, you yep, guys. That's good. Cool. Please connect with Fred if it's not to buy jewelry, even if you want to, you know, join his kind of ecosystem of Shopify business owners. It's really great to see people supporting each other, especially even working together. There's a lot to be said in the power of promoting other businesses and those businesses promoting yours. So reach out to Fred. He's open to communicating. It's Fred, F-R-E-D, at Luca, L-U-C-A, Danny, D-A-N-N-I. Dot com, LucaDanny.com. That's going to be his email. Let's share his LinkedIn as well. I've got the link up there, but you spell his name, Fred Magnanimy. Did I say it right that time? That's it. Yeah. There I just got to go. say okay. it quick. Um, and that, is that Italian? It is. Yeah. It's okay. Italian yeah. I'm Italian. So my last name is D'Onofrio with an apostrophe. That's my legal last yeah, name. Yeah, there you go. And I get all kinds of things. I get Don Frigno, <laughs> Don Friano. Yeah, I would say Don Friano. Yeah, Don Friano. Yeah, all kinds roll, of stuff. Roll it together. So. I get Marisa, Melissa, Marisa. All right, so let me spell Fred's name for you, especially if you're listening on the podcast. It's F R E D, and then his last name M A G N A N I M I. And of course, I'll share how you can connect and check out his website. It's going to be L U C A D A N N I dot com. Luca Danny dot com. Fred, before I let you go, I do want to share our Engage News of the Week. But before I do that, are there any final thoughts you want to share or experiences you want to share before we move on to our News of the Week and wish you wish you a good day? No, I think just anyone who's out there doing it, um, you know, half the battle is just, just taking the leap and doing it. I mean, obviously, don't be reckless, but um, you know, I've found just betting on yourself and you know, if you're starting out a young business on Shopify, it's a grind, but that's, yeah, I miss the days where it was four of us and it was, Aww. you know, just every day was a little bit trial and error. So uh, enjoy it. It's a journey. And uh, like I said, any questions, just reach out. Happy to help however I can. Awesome. If you guys connect on LinkedIn, we always advise, leave a note. That way Fred knows that maybe you heard him on the Engage podcast or saw him on an Engage replay of a show. Leave him a note, let him know where you saw him. And of course, 
it's always great to connect and support small. Would you consider yourself a still a small business now? Or would you consider yourself kind of working up to midsize? I don't know. What do you do you consider yourself? No, I'm a founder. We keep it we keep it small. small. I think it's more yeah. more more fun, more fun this way. I agree. Yeah. I consider you a small business. One small business Saturday, by the way. Is that sometime in the spring? I think. I think it's right after uh Black Friday. Oh, maybe you're right. Yeah. I used well, to live in Texas. there is a small business Saturday. Yeah. I used to live in Texas and I remember I did a small business Saturday like commercial and I didn't remember it being winter, but then again, the winters in Texas are so different yeah. than the winters in Minnesota. So yeah, you might, you might you, be right. Small business. You Saturday. know what I remember about Texas is no uh, state income tax. Yes. And I miss that so much. I also <laughs> lived in Florida with no state income tax. Then I yeah. moved to California where it's like, don't even talk to me about taxes and fees and Oh my goodness gracious. Those tax returns were always miserable. Speaking of that, it's tax yeah. time. How fun is that? I've got to do that in the next uh, week or so. Well, Fred, it has been a wonder, wonderful time to have you here. Don't go anywhere though. Let's get into our Engage Digital Marketing News of the Week. So at the end of every show, we like to share something called the Engage Digital Marketing News of the Week. And being that this year, our series has a Shopify and e-commerce focus, so does our News of the Week. So this week's news of the week is just a little bit more about TikTok. So I'll read through this and then I'll share a link on the article. And Fred, you and I can have a, a quick TikTok chat. So the news of the week this week is as TikTok continues to grow and become a key culture driver in many regions, many advertisers are logically considering how they can tap into the platform in order to boost their promotions. But marketing on TikTok is very different from other platforms more specifically in that TikTok users respond better to native style content, basically that looks like the stuff that would be in the For You feed. So so how do you do that, right? As, a, as an advertiser or as a business, how do you create content to really mimic the content that TikTok users are interacting with? Well, TikTok recently came out with an article and they conducted a study of hundreds of brands to glean some insight into how branded, uh, into the branded content elements that are driving the best response. So basically, I've got a link I'm going to pop up on the screen for you. It's super long. If you're watching, take a screenshot uh, on your computer or with your cell phone. But you can find this article at www.socialmediatoday.com forward slash news. And you're going to look for an article about TikTok sharing tips on how to maximize your branded content. So that's how you're going to find the article. But a few of the tips that, that TikTok actually suggested from their studies is to introduce a character into your clip. Uh, maybe this is like, you know, flow from progressive. Maybe you create a character for your brand and that character pops up through all of your you know, your branded content. And then another suggestion they gave was custom songs. So coming up with your own custom song. And of course, we all know if someone were to take that song and, or take that kind of jingle and create a video from it, you know, then that has that chance to go viral. And then boom, your custom, you know, your custom yeah. song, your brand song is now part of a viral, you know, craziness. So just curious for you, Fred, what has been your experience using TikTok? I know you mentioned it, so I'm assuming you, you are on TikTok. What's worked for you and for your brand? Yeah, so we've just started. Um, the content's very different. I don't, you know, transparently, I don't know that we've figured it out yet. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's got to be very organic. And I think this is one of the things that we're learning, even with 70 plus people is, the channels are all very different, right? So it's really about creating the content. It's a lot of testing of what works. Um, you know, easy to take Facebook content and then try to port it across all the other channels. Reality is you need to create content um, that's specific for the channels. I think the great thing with TikTok is it's not like you need to be in studio. Um, you don't have to hire models. Like the more organic, I think the better. What we are seeing with TikTok is CPMs that are about a quarter of the price of Facebook. Um, so not yet seeing conversions, like Facebook is a really, really, still a really great tool to drive purchase. Um, TikTok is a very cheap way to drive top of funnel brand awareness. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you get the right content and you get some virality with some of these posts, then I think you can get, uh, you can get conversions, but you gotta be there. It's just, that's where people are spending time. One last parting thought is, if you're thinking about marketing and think about ways to drive 
users to your site, which should be top of mind for everyone, you got to think about where people are spending their time. And then you got to figure out how to insert yourself in the conversation and build your brand on those channels. And all those channels are going to be different. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, it's Absolutely. hard, but it's a lot of fun. No, absolutely. And again, that is another common thread that we've been hearing throughout our series is you have to be where your customers are, but it's not just being where they are. You have to look like you're part of their part of their fabric, right? Part of their lifestyle. And one thing that I've been learning, I do some micro influencing um, for a few different brands. It's very interesting. We certainly have learned through testing and experimenting that, like you said, making stuff for the Facebook app and the Facebook portal, and then thinking you can just kind of cross pollinate through all the social channels absolutely yeah. does not work. You really Indeed. have to create uh, content in its organic place, even just for that algorithm to, to work properly and to give you the best boost and the best benefit. I, I share the story all the time, Fred, but I learned this when I did a totally in Instagram, off the cuff video taking a, you know, a very highly played uh, fart sounding soundtrack and did it on my fiance with my dog in it. And the, the, the quality wasn't that good. It was kind of grainy. And I just popped it up on Instagram in my, in my reels and thought, oh, it's kind of funny. I'll probably yeah. take it if it doesn't get any views. It's the first reel I've done that actually like took off. And within a month, it got like 150,000 views, right? Compared oh, yeah, to I believe it. It's just crazy, but it's like the one video I thought, eh, 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 let's do this over here. And then it was like, oh my gosh. And it's because it was organic. It was in the moment. It was funny. Just everything lined up with the algorithm, which, you know, is hard to replicate or duplicate. But once you figure it out, you have a better chance if you play it kind of by the rules, if that makes sense. So, yeah. And the other thing on the algorithm, I think is an important thing is when you get something that works, the clock mm -hmm. is ticking until when that algorithm decides it doesn't want to work anymore. Mm -hmm. You gotta, you gotta run like hell. Um, you know, we 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 we're doing some of these sunflower ads because we're actually putting some paid dollars behind our our give back, and we're actually finding that the content that we didn't think was going to work works, and the content that we feel like really drives the message the best is actually the least efficient. Um, and so, when you're thinking about how you want to like spend your marketing dollars, I think you you gotta have an understanding of like what the consumer wants, and then I think you also have to have, have an understanding of like what the platform actually wants um because if you have something that the platform likes and consumers are engaging with right. you got to really push push dollars as fast as you can a hundred percent thank you so much for joining us today sharing your experience and your insights i'm so happy for you and the brand that you've created i think it's just a wonderful um homage to your family to your family history to your brother danny and you know, I love that you turned something that was a sad memory into something that's beautiful and will literally live on forever. So congratulations to you. And thank, thank you so you. much for sharing all your insights with our audience today. Yeah, this has been awesome. Thank you so much. And like I said, anyone has any questions, just please reach out. Fred at LucaDanny.com, L-U-C-A-D-A-N-N-I.com. Yep. Right? And go Heels. Big, big game tomorrow. Well, good luck with your Carolina team. And again, a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for making time to share your insights on digital marketing intelligence for Shopify. Awesome. You guys, what a wonderful guest Fred was. So many insights to share. I love these case studies and getting a chance to hear firsthand from founders and small business owners, how they've overcome these pain points on Shopify and, and how much Shopify has really helped them because it's so easy to integrate. It's so easy to extract information, manage all these different SKUs. I'm finding these case studies to be very valuable and I hope you are too. If you're just joining us and you missed Fred's show, rest assured, we've got Fred's show available for you and you can find it in our live show library. Let me show you exactly what that looks like. Check out our live show library. Fred's show will be added there in the next 24 to 48 hours. That is where you can find replays of all of our past shows in video format. We also have a podcast library as well. That'll be at engage.com forward slash podcast dash library. Okay, before I let you go, a quick reminder that our next show will be next Thursday, March 31st. Our guest is Whale Amrani. He'll be joining us. He is a Shopify marketing expert. And what he'll be joining us to share is how to dramatically increase your Shopify store sales while actually reducing 
your Facebook and Instagram ad spends. Curious on how you do that? Join me next Thursday, March 31st at 1 p.m. Eastern. On behalf of myself and the whole team at Engage, again, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. If you'd like to connect with me to come on the show and talk about your small business, or maybe you're a Shopify expert and you'd like to join me to share tips and insights, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. I am the Marissa Morgan, T-H-E-M-A-R-I-S-S-A-M-O-R-G-A-N. And my email is Marissa, M-A-R-I-S-S-A dot M at Engage.com. And don't forget to follow Engage on LinkedIn as well. Look for our new app coming very soon in just a few weeks. That is the Engage SMS messaging for Shopify app. We have so many features, so much more than some of the the apps out there. So definitely take a free trial, 30 free days, 500 free messages when we launch. It's been a wonderful time here with you today. Until next time, everybody have a wonderful, wonderful day.